John Cutterback. This is the Intentional Household, a Lifecraft podcast. Join us in seeking timeless wisdom for our time. I'm very happy to have my wife, Sophia, with me here today. And today's episode is The Family Pig, Its Place in Our Home. And I know that might sound a little funny. You know, this, yeah, this, it's a little bit of an offbeat subject, um, I'm sure. A little bit unexpected, but in any case. <laughs> the, 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 our pigs do have a place in our home. And we want to share that uh, because it's a really big part of our life. And it's become a big part of our life uh, kind of intentionally. And it's been very fruitful for us. And that's why we want to share it. Yeah, it's been intentional. But at the same time, it's also kind of unexpected. So we certainly pursued it intentionally and kind of in retrospect, as we look back on every year that we slaughter pigs, we're kind of amazed, overwhelmed, and incredibly grateful for the unlooked for fruits that have come from this um, all engrossing, all involving family experience yeah. of slaughtering pigs in our household. And, and if it so happens that you're considering it for yourself, um, I'd say, we're going to have a word of encouragement for you because even if, uh, you know, Hey, I'm a professor and I can make it sound like, you know, I know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> it, it, this look, I am the guy that did not have this in my background. And, uh, there's been a lot of trial and error here. And error, my, my dear wife error. certainly didn't have it in her <laughs> background. No, that's for Even sure. if you go back a couple of generations, that would be a different situation, but, um, we had to learn, um, we enjoyed so much learning together and now it's become again i i could call it an integral part of of the rhythm of life it's not as though we can't live without doing a pig slaughter but in a sense if in no other way uh in the wonderful food that we're enjoying throughout the year especially at sunday brunch it stays with us and it lives again and i think that's one of the neat aspects of making work regarding food have an important place in the home is that it kind of, it, it, it works its way into all these aspects of your life when you're eating, you know, these other yeah. times after the work is over. Yeah. Now, before we go on, I do, um, I feel like it's really important for us to make absolutely clear that we're not suggesting that this is what everyone needs to do in order to have this experience. I think um, the reason we want to kind of share with you our family experience almost as an illustration is because typical lifecraft fashion what we're looking for is principles um and we just found in the slaughtering of pigs and the preparing of the meat for our entire following year um to have really brought about some really great fruits and so we just wanted to use it as an illustration or example to help us talk a little bit about some of the principles involved so that when you are trying to make a decision, what kind of work are we going to try to do in our home that's going to have similar um, effects that maybe our story might be able to help elucidate some of those principles? Exactly. Exactly. Although this podcast is going to be going to have, a, have a, you know, we're going to be telling some stories. It's, it's going to be gonna details. Be about pigs. So it's not all about, <laughs> all about principles. Although in another podcast on homesteading, we made some distinctions. I just want to refer right now to something that always kind of infer informs our life in our home. And that is what we call homesteading in the broad sense, the homesteading that is um, for everybody in some important sense, uh, essentially includes finding certain kinds of work to do together in the home that is a source of um, connection that unites you with your body that unites you with the other members of the household that unites all of us with the earth and all of these connections are themselves interconnected. Right? This is, this is a key principle of forming a homestead, having a certain kind of work and, and that really is the key principled backdrop for why we thought, Hey, let's, let's do this. And, and, and I have to say in a sense to, to cut to the ending, um, we one way that we know and feel that this has, um, again, by the grace of God, this is this is all gift, but has worked out in so many ways the way we would have hoped and more even better than we could have hoped was uh, sometimes listening to our children kind of unsolicited referring back, most of whom are grown now, um, referring back to the pig slaughters that we did in their childhood. And pretty clearly it was it was important. 
it was very formative. It's very memorable by the way that they talk about it. That's and that, for sure. that gives us a new angle of thinking about it and appreciating yeah. it. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, let's dive into the story. All right. Well, I mean, so first of all, hey, we, we, we've been doing this, what? We're coming almost 20 years, not, not, wow. not, 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 not quite 20 years. <laughs> I don't even know how to count it. <laughs> um, coming up soon on 20 years. And um, we started really not knowing anything. And so it's, it's, it was uh, from the start an exercise in learning from those who know. And that was both in person and through books. And then more a little later on online, although not at the, you know, the proverbial video that you watch of giving demonstration. We've gotten, you know, that has been very helpful. Yeah. Actually, when we started it, I don't think there was really um, YouTube tutorials or videos. Yeah. Yeah. If there were, we didn't know it. I, I, and I, actually the thing, one of the, the, the inspiration that started this whole thing is that actually John loves pigs. He raised pigs for 4-H as a youngster, and he really loves them as an animal. He loves his interaction with them. And so when we started our little homestead here, his first thought was, let's get pigs. I'd love to have pigs. And for the first couple of years, actually, we raised the pigs, and then we would take them to the slaughterhouse when it was time to um, have them processed. And so, um, so that was our start. And as John was raising these pigs, he thought, wow, I, I just... I don't feel good about sending these pigs that I've raised off to a slaughterhouse to end their life and then come back to us in a package. And so we didn't know anything about slaughtering pigs. John didn't, even though he's more adventuresome than I in this regard, and I certainly didn't know anything. Um, And I think really deep down inside, it really um, came down to really not wanting to try to get those pigs into a trailer another year. It was so awful trying to get those pigs in the trailer, Uh, the two of us, um, John with more experience than I, and I with no experience at all. So that was kind of um, a fiasco. So, um, So we decided we wanted to slaughter the pigs on our own. And John's favorite way of finding things out is to find an old timer and ask him, how did you do it? Can you show me? And so we found someone just like that, Mr. Jimmy. And he came to our first slaughter and I just, he was an elderly gentleman who could no longer comfortably stand. And I can picture him sitting in um, a plastic white lawn chair as John was, you know, hiking up the pig and telling him how to eviscerate it and quarter it and all that. And uh, that was a really um, great first step for us. We had kind of felt like we crossed kind of an initiation. And it just felt really amazing to have cared for these pigs. Um, John was the one who oversaw how they were um, killed. And so the killing was very peaceful and merciful and quiet. And we were very grateful for that. And then um, just to process that meat and be eating it. And at the end of that year, we thought, wow, this was really great. But when it comes down to it, we feel like we wasted a lot of pig because we didn't really know how to process it. So the whole next year was really thinking about how can we use everything from the snooter to the pooter, as Mr. Jimmy said. (laughs) Yep. 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 It's, it's, it's true. Boy, there's no doubt having an old timer in person is, is great. Absolutely. beats YouTube. But, 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 you know, for a lot of people, that's just not going to be possible. Although more and more, I will say, I think in the last 20 years, this has caught on and it's more and more people very mm-hmm. happy to say are doing it. And so there might actually be people in your community as there would be now people in my community, including to some extent me, yeah. who would be available to be able to help somebody. Yeah. And I'm certainly not knocking you know. YouTube. I've learned so many things from YouTube, from the people who have been kind enough to post videos of themselves doing things that they know how to do that exactly. I really want to learn how to do. So that so certainly is an acceptable way. Yeah, in for person. sure. But if we yeah. can, it, you know, that would, that that's part of our story. It was a great gift. Not only Mr. Jimmy, but Mr. Doug. Um, and, and, and both of them consistently referring to how their daddy or their granddaddy or grandma would such and such. Yeah, and they'd look just, at John and go, wow, if my daddy saw you doing that, oof. So anyway, that's no, was... true. Mr. Mr. Doug in particular was, was, was clear that <laughs> and D- daddy would not have been pleased with what he himself, Mr. Doug was seeing happening, but be that as man, there's nothing wrong with, with having some higher standards that you realize, okay, well, not reaching those right now, but we got something to, to work for. Let's give it, let's give a little sense of just here basically is the structure of a couple of days, which are the main, main days of work. Um, we do it the way where you, there's two ways that you can um, 
take care of the skin and hair situation. Either you scald a pig, which means dip in hot water and thus scrape off the hair and leave the skin on and begin the processing at that point. Or you can strip all of the skin off with the hair, which has certainly become the more common way now. And certainly the way it is done in slaughterhouses or they just strip that skin with the hair right off. And others do that at home too. The old fashioned way that almost it would always be done in homesteads was some way either by normally by scalding some traditions uh, did it by a kind of burning to get the hair off and because there are reasons they wanted to still have the skin on, which we don't have to go into at the moment, but we definitely did it the way that Mr. Doug and Mr. Jimmy said to do it is, is, is you scald and you got to get that water to the exact right temperature. You dip that in there. And that, you know, this is of course after the pig is, is dead, which happens by um, you know, trigger warning here. This is not pleasant, but um, for us, it's, it's very important. I'll tell you right now, um, I am the one that kills the pigs. I have kind of presided over their life, their growth. They know me and they trust me. And I want to tell you something, in some sense, the term trust. Right? These words are used analogously. And with these higher animals, it's, it's amazing. You can have a kind of relationship there. I always remember when a student in my classroom once said, Dr. Cutterback, how can you kill an animal that trusts you? Isn't that betrayal? I thought of that for a moment. And I said, I see why you ask. But honestly, the fact that this animal, in some important sense, trusts me is exactly why this is how I want it to die because it trusts me. And so I'm able to kill it instantly or well nigh instantly where it never expected anything was coming. And that is something that I like to be able to do for the animals that are dying at my hands. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a bullet between the eyes and done rightly it basically immediately stuns them so that please God, hopefully they're not really feeling anything. And, and then you, and then you stick them, uh, trying to get, uh, the jugular vein. And, um, and the first couple of times we didn't, we did it. We did not collect the blood. Now we do collect the blood, which makes one of the most wonderful things, blood sausage. And, uh, so then you know, bleed them out, dead pig. That's the kind of somber, we always begin with, a, of course, a prayer. And then we also, before I uh, pull the trigger, I say, thank you, Lord, for the life of this pig. Begin in gratitude, end in gratitude. And, and, and it, it evokes this. A pig slaughter evokes that. You're looking at a living animal there, a noble creature. So it, 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 it invokes a sense of seriousness, a kind of, of responsibility. And I think it really sets the tone for the rest of the day, the way the carcass is handled, the way all the cuts are handled. I think everybody goes into the work feeling that they owe a kind of reverence or respect to this animal that will be in turn feeding us. And so the entire day kind of almost starts with a certain kind of tone being set of reverence and gratitude and kind of a profound feeling of our own stewardship and the requirements of stewardship is that we reverence and respect and, um, Rejoice and be grateful. Yeah, I, I, I also want to say those that I understand. I understand why people um, recoil a bit the notion of killing an animal to eat it. I really do. And we don't have to go into that at the moment other than just to say, actually, I had a great conversation once with someone who doesn't eat an animal's meat because he said he's not comfortable with killing an animal. And thus, he doesn't want to eat the meat that someone else killed. He feels if he's not comfortable killing it himself and he shouldn't eat it. And, and, and I can respect that. And I'm happy to say he was at least he saw something important when I shared my story. He said, well, in case this gives me a new angle of of you john you know being willing to do that difficult thing of killing the killing the animal and killing it with a certain reverence you know that 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 in any case gave him a little bit of a different angle um onto it so again yeah, thank you that's a great way of putting it kind of sets the tone for the day um in in, in short now just kind of get quick overview after the scalding them the pig is raised up um the traditional way to put it do it is on a tripod we've also used the bucket of a tractor 
we'll come back to the issue of technology, which mm-hmm. is an ever interesting. Do, do, where, where, so you have the pig hanging and then you, and then you eviscerate it. You kind of slice it open. You take out all the innards and uh, which is a delicate operation. The more you get used to doing it, it's, it's a very satisfying uh, job because done well, done cleanly, it's actually kind of a be- beautiful, you get to see these wonderful organs. Um, it, 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 it's not a smelly job if you don't puncture anything that you shouldn't puncture. <laughs> And, uh, and just some, like D- Jimmy's daddy taught you, <laughs> sometimes you succeed in that and sometimes you don't got, you know, earlier on, it was a little bit more of a question, but in, in any case, then you slice that carcass in half, wash it out with the hose, put it up on the slaughter, the, the cutting boards, and then you start to do what are called the primal cutting of it. And this is all in the first day. Primal cuttings are basically you know, so, so much fun to talk about. They're taking out the main kind of parts, getting the side for the bacon, the, these, these, you know, okay, this, this leg that we're going to do this with, kind of setting the ribs, setting all the main parts um, apart from one another and setting them aside and putting them in a cooler. And that's what we do on the first day. The second day is, is, is fundamentally processing, most of all, making sausage and salting those things are going to be turned into bacon primarily the sides that can be bacon they need to be salted or actually I do that the first night but um the second day more processing those are the big and those are b- two big kind of um full days that that basically gets it done but there's other things so most of it should be put up in that time but there's certain things you know like the sides of bacon that still need to be cured there's certain other things that can linger on beyond that but kind of for us two very full hard days of work is what it looks like. And so you, you got to kind of plan, plan ahead. When am I going to be able to take two days where it's, it's going to be exhausting and you're going to have to set everything else aside. Yeah. I, it's exhausting. I, I said to John after the first several years of um, slaughtering pigs, I don't think that I've ever gone to bed so physically exhausted um, after pig slaughter days Although I will say that it's the kind of exhaustion that you drop into bed and you immediately find relief in sleep versus the exhaustion of anxiety, stress, worrying, mental planning. You lay down in bed and your mind is still racing. And so it was really interesting to see how physical labor um, is very taxing and demanding. But at the same time, there seems to be a design in nature to give respite from physical labor very immediately. Um, versus kind of the mental, psychological, emotional labor that seems to be the primary labor Mm -hmm. that we engage in nowadays. Mm -hmm. It's much harder to find rejuvenation after that kind of effort. I will also say that on the second day, the day that we make sausage, um, the first several years, it was just really hard because we had sausage where the fat would separate and you'd end up with a really greasy pan and really dry sausage. And so hard. You spent so much time doing all this work and you have a year's worth of sausage in your basement that doesn't taste very good. Um, And it really took us several years of really digging around to find out what is this technique of emulsifying the fat. And it's just interesting to see that there weren't very many places that we could cast around to find that information. And now that we have it, it's very simple. It's nothing that's erudite or difficult or anything like that. It's very simple, but we just didn't have the knowledge and we didn't know where to turn to get it. And so anyway, I have to say it's a point of uh, incredible feeling of satisfaction of that. Now I know something that I didn't know before that actually makes a pretty big difference. That's for sure. (laughs) Well, you know, when you speak of Sophia of going to bed, so tired, it just makes me think, we think a little bit here about this kind of work. It's really, it's, it was unlike anything I'd ever done. Mm -hmm. And uh, it makes me think of that kind of trio we've talked about of, work that unites you to your own body, work that unites you to your loved ones, work that unites you to the earth, to nature. And this work is so much all three of those things. Mm -hmm. But I mean, particularly that, that first one, I mean, you, you feel your body, its strength, its limitations for sure. Yeah. And you know, an interesting part of that is, is the way and this, well, that, that, that shades very quickly into how it unites you with others. There's a place for everybody in the pig slaughter. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a place for those who are, who who are, who are smaller, who who are not as strong. Um, You know, whether it's scraping off, scraping off the hair and helping later and cutting up the, 
meat. Uh, we, we're going to have to tell them about some of the ooh, aspects of making blood sausage and you in the kitchen there. Uh, that's, yes. um, I've never actually been in the kitchen while you've done that. And I know that can be a little <laughs> scary, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, um, it's just, it's so remarkable the, the place there is for strength. And to really use that strength, you know, moving that pig around and hoisting it up and get and getting this done, you, you you're grateful for the strength of your body. Or maybe if you don't have that so much yourself anymore, like Mr. Jimmy, when he's given a direction, you're grateful for the strength of other people's bodies who are working with you. Mm -hmm. And and there you are together, each having a place, each belonging, each being part of something is so clearly one project. We're so together in this arduous task, an, an arduous, worthwhile, meaningful task so brings people together. And, and just quickly, that third one, obviously, this is uniting you to the earth. Uh, I mean, because pigs, animals are close to the earth. You know, it, it, it's there's, there's you have this sense of of, of nature in a natural plan and the natural structure of the body of the pig that you need to discover that you have to work with that's been given to you almost how does your body fit with this with this body there's there's there's, there's, there's so much connectedness there and as you say put, put all that together it's a full person effort that absolutely does wear you out, but wears you out because you've done something so big. Yeah. And the, your point about uniting to the earth, it's its not just on slaughter day, but that the entire time you're raising the pig, um, John is really the one, and well, the children certainly had the pig chores also feeding the pigs and things like that. But you're continuously aware throughout the entire season. What is the pasture like? Oh, the acorn fall is coming now. Let's move them or they can get more acorns. Can we collect more acorns? And so there's a certain sense in which the pigs on the land throughout their life, because we're just raising the ones that we need for our family. This is like hand raising, so to speak, in a certain sense. I mean, they're on their own in the pasture. and But, but you're watering them. You're feeding them. You're very aware of their cycles. And so you know, the, the slaughter is the culmination of that moment, although it's not the end, because I think that that spirit of stewardship and reverence that you have on slaughter day actually um, comes and visits us every time we take something out of the freezer that's from that pig. I just, every time we take a piece of meat out, I, it's kind of exciting. Oh, this is our pig. Oh, how did, this, how did the smoking turn out this year? Oh, this year's sausage is really great. And so we just, it's like, it continues that reverence and that respect and that stewardship that started during the seasons of stewardship of caring for the pig, which is very much connected to the earth. It, so it's not just slaughter day that connects no. us. It's the entire experience of this, um, assuming a kind of responsibility in the stewardship of the life of the pig throughout its lifetime, the slaughtering, and then in the final consuming of it. Amen. And, 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 and I will say, I think that raising an animal, a pig is, is a kind of the classic example. I mean, in America, for sure, in, in, in many, many other cultures, it was kind of the classic, even the poor can have a pig. And, yeah. and by the way, it, it is amazing how they are in a way that most of the other farmyard animals or homestead animals are not. They're omnivorous. Chickens are kind of omnivorous too. Um, but this aspect of being able to give them waste from the garden, give them waste from, from the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, th this is, th this can make for an amazing <laughs> natural recycling as it were, you know, mm -hmm. this, you know, the, the, these vegetables that got overripe or that rotted, um, you know, this broth that you ended up, you know, spoiling, you know, uh, not that I'm recommending giving them badly spoiled broth, but something that's gone beyond, you know, when you would have had it, oh, okay, we're just going to give this to the pig. Mm -hmm. And, and they, and, and, and it's, it's not crass to say they turn it into pork. They're not a machine, but they're, they're, they're a natural creature. <laughs> that that by a wonderful design ingests and grows healthy in eating these things you need to be attentive you know you don't just feed them anything and everything although there's an amazing variety and again that brings everything together even this listening to you dear again talking about noticing the acorns 
um, it, 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 there's, there's so many different aspects of what went into this season, this whole year, this, the work of, mm -hmm. of taking care of and growing them. That's, that's all brought together and it can't, in a sense, kind of brought to a focal point at the actual slaughter. But then again, that's even itself just the next step in this, in this, in this wonderful story of, of human nourishment, of, of human growth, of the life that we're making together according to a kind of <coughs> natural rhythm. And all that has come together. And, and, and I really would say, in a sense, the culmination is, say, having family and guests at the Sunday brunch. A guest says, oh, is this, is this, is this your own bacon? Well, actually, actually it is. Yeah. And you smile and there's, you know, you're not going to start to tell the whole story right there, but there's just so much. Yep. Yep. What a gift. Yeah. This, yes. the season of the previous year also is present when we're eating because we, you know, it tastes different every year, depending on what the season was. And, and to that extent, every Sunday when we sit down and have that pork, the people who helped us with that particular slaughter that yeah. year are yeah. present with us. So yeah. it's really, I just want to also share that, that this notion of everyone has a place and everybody participates. That's really kind of my greatest recollection throughout the years of the little children who are not um, kind of tucked away somewhere. Let's send them to someone's house so we can take care of this efficiently. It's like everyone's there and everyone's underfoot. And everybody, in fact, has something that they can do according to their skill. And I have to say, that's really a wonderful thing uh, in a family environment because so often the little children are in the way or preventing what needs to be done to be gotten done. And we just feel like we need to just put them aside a little bit so we can actually do this thing that we really need to get done in our life. And the slaughter weekend is really something that I have found all of our children have been able to participate in, whether yeah. it's carrying sticks to throw on the fire first for the scalding cauldron or, um, you know, bringing out food for everyone to have for lunch or, or, you know, running around chasing everyone with a pig's tail to irritate them or the next day putting meat into the hopper for grinding. It's just, it's been an extraordinary way to see. And this past um, fall, my 89 year old mother-in-law really wanted to participate and she came and she sat at the counter and she prepared herbs and, you know, really it, it's, it really is amazing yeah. how there is a place for everyone. And it's a work that everyone is just so grateful to contribute to. And so we feel really close to one another. Uh, and on that score, I just want to express um, the gratitude I have for the various families, the friends and their children through the years yeah. that we've had the opportunity to work with. I'm not going to name them, but the, you know, it, it, it lives on as it yeah, were it's such in, a gift. In, in that work that we've shared together. And, you know, that's, I, I, I think a lot of people have experienced that. Tell us just a little bit, because I, I just think it, 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 it's, it's part of the whole learning experience and how you learn to test certain limits and maybe certain things you don't do again. Mm -hmm. But the, the very, you know, the first time that we did the blood sausage, just mm -hmm. give us a little window into, uh, you know, someone arriving with, with a tray of, of blood mm -hmm. and you realizing, I got to do something right now because this stuff's congealing. Yeah, it's pretty. It's a pretty amazing testimony to this resilience of the human person to be able to meet whatever challenges they encounter. Uh, I'll just never forget the first year we decided to do blood sausage. John came in the evening before and said, "Oh, well, you're in charge of the blood tomorrow, and this is the recipe." And I just burst out laughing. I was sure he was joking. So this was really. I can't even begin to describe to you how I am so not that person. So anyway, and my two oldest girls and I were in the kitchen when that blood arrived and we just were kind of in a panic about this is congealing. I just said, Magdalena, you just need to keep stirring that blood. You need to keep moving it. So, so poor Magdalena standing over this big pot of blood, stirring it so it doesn't congeal. We have since learned that there are other more simple ways to keep blood from congealing. So it's more humane, but, um, you know, and then I got to the end of the recipe and at the bottom of the recipe, it said, uh, before baking the sausage taste, to adjust the seasonings. And I just looked at my girls. I said, mm -mm, no way this is going in the way it is. I'm not tasting this. But, uh, uh, I did, we did have an opportunity to taste a really good English black pudding. And then I said, oh, is this what this is supposed to taste like? And that inspired me to, and I knew I it's, it's a little bit like if you're cooking, never having tasted something, which I would never have eaten blood sausage or black pudding beforehand. I was totally moving forward in the dark having had a good English 
black pudding out of a culture that which is know, just their name for, for blood, blood sausage. sausage and and it's coming out of a culture of people who have continuously continue you know eaten this prepared it and eaten it then i had an imagination for it and um all is well now and we're it, it works pretty well <laughs> it, it it really is well and and not i I love, I love being able to offer to guests and it, we don't, we don't make it into some kind of freak show. Guess what this is. And we certainly don't pull this one. Guess what you just ate. <laughs> but, but we do love to be able to say, Hey, we make some blood sausage. Um, if you want to know, we will tell you what's in it. And it's fundamentally blood and then some oats and you know, some onions and some lard and some great seasonings. Yeah. And it, 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 I, it honestly is my favorite hearts just neck in neck with the bacon yeah. for what, for my favorite product. And it's not everybody's, it's not everybody's favorite by any stretch of the imagination, but I'd say of our guests, 50%, a good 50% say, wow, that's really good. And maybe 25% say, yeah, you know, that, that's okay. I wouldn't particularly have any more. And, you know, maybe the other 25% wish they hadn't had it at all. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. it, it, it's, or, and some people don't try it. Just psychologically, they don't want to try it. Which this I is, get. This I is get that. never about, oh, come on. You know, if you were a man, you know, you'd, you'd try the blood sauce. I just want to say, it, sometimes I've seen that on, on, you know, maybe good, you know, all well intentionally, there can be this kind of, bravado involved with 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 some of the work of the homestead and it's particularly it involves knives and guns and and death and blood and um there is something primal about uh, slaughtering a pig but I, I i think it's it's a great opportunity especially for fathers to be teaching their sons and for me, all men to realize about themselves and just focusing there for a moment as regards to this kind of primal element of, of kind of the importance of the combination of strength and restraint and strength and gentleness and strength and respect. Mm -hmm. This is, this is never about chest thumping. This is never about proving something, um, uh, it, to anybody, I, I, either in the slaughtering or in the eating. Oh, well, we don't find that gross. Why do you find that gross? No, that's just that's just not helpful. But 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 our experience has been particularly approached with a good attitude. People might just find that there are some of these foods that we're not used to because we've lost these practices. They don't particularly fit well with the modern way of life. And it really is interesting. I mean, how particularly around here in the Shenandoah Valley, old timers, that foods that were more standard for them in something like scrapple, mm -hmm. you know, something like head cheese, something like blood sausage, these, these things kind of curl our hair. Oh my gosh. I mean, you know, what's wrong with the old timers that they ate these things. It's funny how we just get set in our ways. Well, that's not in the supermarket. It can't be, can't be very good. Mm -hmm. Well, that that's part of the treasure is actually rediscovering beautiful, great things, nourishing things, sometimes very delicious things um, that are just that are part of an art that we can that we can recover and and modify for where we are now. And I yeah. think that's an important aspect. Of yeah. This. And I think that modifying it for where we are now and people not liking certain things, it has also kind of factored into our decision about which things we do and which things we can't do. Although before we go on to that, I just want to circle back to, you were you know, talking about chest thumping and kind of bravado. And I, I think that kind of attitude really comes about when people have isolated an activity or concept, a person, a behavior, and kind of looked at it as kind of an isolated entity. You can, like, deformation seems to happen when you look at something in an isolated context. And I think one of the things that really helps prevent that in this circumstance, where it really could be possible to engage in these kind of slightly perverted approaches, is that starting the day with the spirit of reverence, gratitude, respect, and a profound sense of stewardship. I think that permeates the whole experience. And while, you know, those who are working with knives to do the hard, really physically difficult job of quartering, quartering the pig, you know, they, they are feeling a real delight in the kind of strain of their body and putting it to the test and succeeding. 
And actually, it's really kind of a gift because they can feel that in a way that's not in any way laced with something um, unpleasant or kind of unpalatable or kind of inappropriate bravado because it's 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 embarked upon with the spirit of respect, a spirit of respect and reverence and gratitude. And so it's really a great way that you can experience kind of some of the most kind of primal in the sense of physical demand, but at the same time without it becoming kind yeah. of a deformation. So, you, you know, dear, but, and you're saying that it just comes to my mind and we don't have to pursue this, especially right now, but I'll just notice you know, a, a really challenging ongoing issue in the homestead, in, in marriage and in, in life is the compliment, the difference in complementarity of man and woman. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'll, I'll just put it this way. I think a pig slaughter is well suited as many other of the great works of the traditional home arts that we can still kind of recover and modify as necessary in our in our homes today there are great contexts to discover and enact that difference mm -hmm. and, and and you know just part of that you know to, to state the most obvious but i think it's it, it's good to see it because it's part of the gift that that, that a man's body tends to be stronger is is an important thing at that moment where we together are ho hoisting up something that weighs 300 pounds. And I'm not saying that we don't never let a girl try this. That's, that's not the point. But because um, we've had, I'd say, you know, if we went through it, which we won't do right now, the, the um, there's kind of a natural division of labor. Not that there's no intersection. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the women folk tend to be more in the kitchen, kind of preparing things Seasoning and, 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 and such and uh, not that they're not coming also and helping and yep, they in certainly cutting have been part and, of the primal link and, and, too and, and, so and, it's a very uh, free-flowing environment i almost want to say especially the younger ladies and girls you know can particularly enjoy coming and doing that and that's and that's and that's wonderful but but that there's still the, the, the you kind of feel this difference and respect this difference while not making it be you know lock a so principle you know, difference that, that absolutely yeah. has to be well we don't we don't you know cross over it in these ways no mm -hmm. but 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 you just kind of receive the gift of, of 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 a man's particular bodily strength there and you and you receive the gift of kind of the the heartfulness of of i'm just going to say in any case in the concrete here of, of sophie in the kitchen and the way that she presides there there's something so unique for me to, to send and only send one of the children back with a tray of blood and to the house and knowing that Sophia's inside often with a couple other, maybe whether it's our daughters or a couple students I haven't mentioned, you know, I, students of ours through the years have come. And again, what a gift, what a thing that mm -hmm. kind of binds us and those great memories we're so grateful for. So, but um, you'll often have a couple young ladies there with, with you that you're mentoring you're passing on a kind of spirit and feel for the kitchen and, and, and the great diversity of things that go on there and the rich art that it is that you are practicing uh, while ever learning and having mm -hmm. to learn more and learn from others. You're passing that on in a special way to our daughters. And I, and, and I think that's part of, of obviously of preparing them to be that very special, unique presence at the heart of their own homes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we, we've, we've shared here with you a little bit of a picture of, of how ours has looked and some of the reasons that we're grateful there. I just want to, in wrapping up, say, and tell me, dear, if there's anything else that you want to share, that in sharing all this, what, what, what especially is our hope? Kind of what's the, we certainly don't want to do this in a spirit of, well, check us out. We're, we're so great. We're certainly not the only ones doing this. And I'm glad we're not the only ones doing this. And may there be a movement of more people who are in a position to be homesteading kind of in this fuller sense where they have um, 
animals in in their homestead. And I just if you're wondering from the question of our title, you know, the, the pig's place in our home. Never had a pig inside the four walls of the home <laughs> other than when it was a, a very young piglet who had gotten abandoned by its mother. That moment, everyone kind of was loving, almost hoping for that to happen so that she can have a little piglet there in the bathtub yeah. and be taking taking care of it. But otherwise, otherwise everything has a place on the homestead and the pig's place is not inside the four walls, although it's not far outside the four walls. And it becomes a very much a part of our household community, uh, community project. But we, but we wanted, wanted to say that there's other works that we hope that this points to certain features that can be done in other ways through other of the home arts. And to give this as an example of something that can be such a great gift, why it is such a great gift, and maybe encourage you if you are in that situation to actually be able to do this yourself, or if nothing else, you could go and help someone else who does. Yeah. And I think um, kind of in closing here, I want to say that I think maybe if we are aware that certain kinds of work that we do has the power to unite us that way, that you can have this kind of experience in doing other things in the home. Um, although I have to say slaughtering a pig is, has a kind of intensity that it's hard to repeat. I can think of other things that we've done that have had a similar experience of uniting the family, including everyone. Um, I think it makes a big difference if you go into the work or the labor being aware that it can do this for you. Otherwise, sometimes it can just be a burden or a chore. And then we lose all the good opportunities that we that are pre presented to us to unite us to one another and the land and ourselves. So um, I, I think that what we're really hoping is in giving you a little bit of a description of the details that maybe it will awaken your imagination to see that there are things that you're already doing that have the power to unite you in that same way if we just actually begin to see that it's pulling us in that direction to be united to ourselves, one another, and the earth. Yeah, so I, I it's, like it's about becoming aware of the good that's already around us and the good that we're already doing. And, and, and as a word of encouragement, if you do, if you do give it a whirl, if you do, do go this route, remember, if at kind of the end of the first day or halfway through the first second day or all the way through the second day, you have the experience of, I can't believe we did this. What was wrong with us? What were we thinking? <laughs> then uh, uh, let us assure you, we company. have been there. <laughs> and that's part of the reason in closing, I really do think I can't think of a better natural analogy for life, for our life together in the household. It's something we're all working on together. We've got a ton to learn. We need a lot of help from other people to do it. Sometimes you just think you're not going to make it, but you pray and you gather yourself together and you, and, and, and you keep going and you persevere and you end up finding you had more in you than perhaps you realized and that the fruits of persevering according to a kind of natural plan are greater than you ever could have imagined. For sure. Great spending a little time with you. Take care. We'll see you next time. Bye.